The geological law of superposition states that sedimentary layers are deposited sequentially one on top of another, and therefore the oldest layers will be on the bottom and the youngest on top. This presentation examines how this principle applies to the Carolina Bays by examining their overlaps. The law of superposition is one of the fundamental principles of geology. Dust carried by the wind or by water creates layers that build up over time, producing a sequence of sedimentary layers that eventually harden into rock. These layers can become exposed when earthquakes displace the land or when rivers carve channels through the layers as has happened in the Grand Canyon. The older layers are always at the bottom and the newer or younger layers are at the top. The glacier ice impact hypothesis proposes that the Carolina Bays were created by secondary impacts of glacier ice boulders that were ejected by one or more extraterrestrial impacts on the Laurentide ice sheet. The sequence of these impacts can be determined in two ways. The first and most accurate way of determining the sequence of emplacements is by examining the overlaps of the impact basins. A large bay emplaced on top of a small bay will completely obliterate the small bay and only the large bay will be visible. Partial overlaps will generally be evident because the later impacts produce rims that erase the rims of previously emplaced bays. In this example, a portion of basin number 1 was overlaid by basin number 2, so we know that basin 2 was created after basin 1. Basin number 2 may have overlaid completely other basins, but we have no way of knowing this because the impact that created basin 2 would have obliterated any previous basins at that location. Basin number 3 was emplaced after basin number 2. We can determine this because the impact that made basin number 3 overlay the portion of the rim of basin number 2. The second way of determining the sequence of emplacement of the Carolina Bays is by calculating their angle of impact from their width to length ratio and applying ballistic equations to determine their time of emplacement. This second method relies on the accuracy of the impact model of formation of the base rather than on the geological law of superposition. In this example, the basins do not overlap, but from the width to length ratios of the ellipses we are able to determine that basin number 1 corresponds to an impact angle of 33.1 degrees and basin number 2 corresponds to an impact angle of 35.2 degrees. Assuming that the glacier ice boulders that made these basins traveled a distance of 1,120 kilometers, the projectile that made basin 1 had a flight time of 386 seconds, whereas the projectile that made basin 2 had a flight time of 401 seconds. From this, we conclude that basin 1 was made 15 seconds before basin 2. Calculations like this are useful to supplement the evidence provided by overlapping features. This is an example of the chaotic bombardment by the ballistic sedimentation of the ice ejecta. Four small basins have been given the number 1 because they were in place before basins number 2 and 3. Basin 1B was created after basin 1A because it overlays the splash zone made by basin 1A, but the order of creation of basins 1C and 1D cannot be determined. Basin number 2 was created next because it overlays two of the small basins, and basin number 3 was created last because it overlaps two of the small basins and basin number 2. Dating studies of the Carolina Bays have produced a wide range of dates. The paper by Brooks, Taylor, and Ivester published in 2010 says that, quote, Based on 45 optically stimulated luminescence dates, active shorelines and associated aeolian deposition occurred during marine isotope stage MIS-2 to late MIS-3, 12 to 50,000 years before the present, MIS-4 to very late MIS-5, 60 to 80,000 years before the present, and late MIS-6, 120 to 140,000 years before the present. These age ranges also correspond with the ages of other aeolian landforms in the coastal plain, including sand sheets and dune fields, and suggest a climatic threshold was crossed during the transition towards stadials, initiating both bay and dune activity." End quote. The dates reported for a single Carolina Bay in this paper range from about 2,000 years ago to more than 74,000 years ago, but this was done without using any clues about the superposition of the bays. Unfortunately, the dates for a single Carolina Bay do not allow us to evaluate the accuracy of the optically stimulated luminescence dating method against the relative dates implied by the overlaps of the bays. It would be useful to conduct an experiment on Carolina Bays that overlap to see if the OSL dates confirm the relative sequence of emplacement indicated by the law of superposition.
If the dates do not agree with the stratigraphic sequence, then we will know that there is something wrong with the OSL dates. Thus far, the accuracy of the dates obtained by OSL has not been questioned, and this has led to the conclusion that the Carolina base developed over thousands of years. By contrast, the impact hypothesis proposes that the Carolina base and the Nebraska rainwater basins, which share the same elliptical geometry, were created within a few minutes of each other by a catastrophic saturation bombardment of glacier ice boulders. From the ballistic equations, we know that the time of flight of the glacier ice boulders ejected by an extraterrestrial impact on the Laurentide ice sheet by the Great Lakes was approximately 6 to 9 minutes, depending on the launch velocity and the launch angle. During these three minutes, there was a catastrophic hailstorm of enormous glacier ice boulders that killed megafauna from the Rocky Mountains to the east coast of the United States. These two large Carolina bays measuring almost one kilometer were made by impacts of ice boulders about the size of Yankee Stadium. The two large bays were formed by the last of a series of impacts in the same area. From the overlaps, we can determine that the formation of Basin 5 was preceded by the emplacement of Basins 1 and 2. Basin 3 was emplaced before Basin 4, and Basin 5 was emplaced last. We can see that Basin 5 was emplaced last because it overlaid the rim of Basin 4. However, the bombardment continued, and a small ice projectile with a very high trajectory and long flight time impacted the rim of Basin 5 to create the small Basin number 6. Whenever we see small Carolina bays inside the larger bay, we know that the smaller bays were created after the large one. The reason for this is that the formation of a large bay on top of a small base completely destroys the small bays. In this example, we see several small bays inside the large one. This indicates that some small chunks of ice fell after the big one. A small impact occurring within a larger one is sometimes seen in the experimental model. This photograph shows an arrow pointing to the circular impact made by some debris right after an ice projectile made a larger inclined conical cavity. The ice projectile is still visible at the apex of the cavity. The depth of the cavity is later reduced by viscous relaxation to create a shallow elliptical impact basin. A landscape of overlapping Carolina bays, as illustrated in this image, can be simulated experimentally. Notice that several small basins were present before the large basin overlaid them. The landscape can be replicated by the impacts of some small projectiles on a viscous medium. In a previous presentation, I estimated that the penetration of the projectile for making a 1 km Carolina Bay would take one third of a second, and the formation of the conical cavity would take about 7 seconds. During the formation of the Carolina Bays, the seismic vibrations of the impacts liquefy the soil, creating the viscous terrain necessary for the formation of inclined conical cavities, and the trembling ground speeded viscous relaxation, thereby reducing the depth of the cavities from the bottom up. An impact by a larger projectile on top of the smaller impact basin creates the usual penetration funnel with overturned flaps. After viscous relaxation, the experimental impact shows the overlapping basins with raised rims analogous to what we see in the LiDAR images of the Carolina Bays. The hypothesis that the Carolina Bays were made by wind and water mechanisms over thousands of years does not have an explanation for the elliptical geometry of the bays and their overlapping stratigraphy, but the experimental impact model provides an easily visualized explanation of the forces that created these geological structures. The penetration funnels have overturned flaps. The formation of the cavity by the passage of the projectile displaces target material from a deeper layer and creates the crater flanges. In this image, we can see that the green sand that was on the surface of the target material is now covered by material that came from a deeper layer. Inverted stratigraphy is a typical characteristic of impact craters. The book on impact cratering by Professor J. Meloche illustrates a cross-section of the rim of an impact crater. The rim is stratigraphically uplifted by horizontal compressive forces and plastic deformation of the underlying rocks. In addition, the rim height is made up of ejecta deposited on the original ground surface. Near the rim, the original stratigraphy of the surface rock units is inverted. If we were to obtain a coarse sample from the rim of an impact crater, we would see the youngest material in the top layer, followed by older material excavated by the projectile from a deeper layer, and going deeper we would find the young material that was on the surface of the terrain at the time of the impact.
Fortunately, such a core sample from the rim of a Carolina Bay was reported in a 2012 publication by Ted Bunch and 17 co-authors. At the time that the paper was written, the Carolina Bays were thought to have been formed by gradualistic wind and water mechanisms, so the significance of the inverted stratigraphy was not recognized. The authors write, quote, The two dates at 107 and 183 centimeters below the surface were used to generate an H-depth model, excluding the sample at 152 centimeters below the surface because of the large magnitude of the H-reversal, that is, older sediments lying stratigraphically higher than younger sediments, end quote. The sample at 183 centimeters below the surface seems to correspond to the surface at the time of the extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago. Viscous relaxation reduces the depth of the conical cavities and the overturned flaps become raised rims. Using optically stimulated luminescence to date the Carolina base is problematic because OSL is intended for use on sedimentary layers and not on a landscape whose stratigraphy was scrambled by impacts. Even though optically stimulated luminescence is a very accurate dating method for sedimentary structures, when applied to the Carolina base, it will be necessary to test whether this method is able to give results that are consistent with the geological law of superposition. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina base and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. I will continue to examine the Carolina base one bay at a time. My book about the Carolina base is available at Amazon. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of future videos about the Carolina base.